Right. Okay, welcome, welcome ladies and gentlemen. For this afternoon, this session, we have Lindsay Holmwood, who's going to tell us about us. Please make him feel welcome. <laughs> Uh, G'day everyone, uh, my name's Lindsay Homewood. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, this thing called the mirroring hypothesis, uh, which you may know through another term that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, so just to, to give you sort of a brief introduction, the first half is going to be uh, sort of about the mirroring hypothesis and how that works in uh, the non-open source world, and the second half will be a compare and contrast where we go sort of do a bit of a deep dive into how the mirroring hypothesis works differently in open source. Uh, so, who here is familiar with this particular quote? Okay, a fair number of people. Um, so, this is a fairly common sort of meme within our industry as a whole, uh, put forward by Melvin Conway uh, in 1967. And he, uh, sorry, 1968. Uh, this was originally published in the Datamation magazine of April 1968. Uh, There's a whole paper behind this. He originally submitted it to the Harvard Business Review. It actually got rejected because they didn't believe there was enough empirical evidence to be able to back it up. Uh, but he did manage to get it into Datamation magazine only a couple of months later. Uh, and so in this paper, uh, Conway has more than just this one quote that we just saw a second ago uh, to say about you know, the way that organizations build systems. Uh, one of the other interesting things that he said was that the, the, uh, that the design which occurs first is almost never the best possible. Uh, the prevailing system concept itself may need to change, and the flexibility of the organization is really important to effective design. And we see echoes of this all the way through the open source movement uh, to where we are today. And thus, he says that a design effort should be organized according to the needs for communication uh, to actually you know, build and design the thing. Uh, and this was referenced in uh, Fred P. Brooks's Mythical Man Month. Quick show of hands who hasn't read this. Okay, just a couple of people. That's sort of like a seminal work within our industry. Uh, and he, uh, he attributed uh, a bunch of these different ideas to, uh, to Conway, and we have Conway's law. Um, and the rest has sort of been history. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind with Conway's law is it's not really a law. It's more of an adage or like a, a sociological or anthropological observation about how, uh, how teams end up building and producing systems. Uh, so it turns out that outside of tech, there have been two separate research traditions um, that have actually been studying this for the last 60 years. And we are practically oblivious to it within the technology space. Uh, so the two different traditions that have, that have been happening, uh, one is around, well, the first one is obviously in computer science with Conway's law, uh, which is what we know. Uh, outside of that, there is a uh, research tradition within management, uh, a management theory and organization psychology around organization designs and organizations as complex systems. Uh, we also have, in the management space, product design and products as complex systems. And so it turns out that there's a whole bunch of really interesting and revealing information in these. There's, there's close to 250 studies that have been produced uh, in different papers that have been produced over the last sort of 60 years. And there's a lot of interesting stuff that we can learn from that and apply within open source. Uh, and that's sort of all culminated in this paper that was put forward uh, in, it was about September of 2016. Uh, called the Mirroring Hypothesis Theory, Evidence and Exceptions. And it's a meta-analysis of about 250 of these papers over that period of time. Uh, it's about a 27-page read. It's pretty easy to go through. Uh, but this is actually the first time that there was a formal definition of this thing called the Mirroring Hypothesis, which states that in a complex system, the technical architecture and division of labor will mirror one another in the sense that the network structure of one will correspond to the structure of another. Now, the thing about it being presented as a hypothesis is that we can both validate it and invalidate it. And that's what we're going to be exploring today when we're talking about how this works within open source communities. So what is mirroring? What do we know about it from a research perspective? So the, the fundamental tenet of mirroring is that within any sort of collaborative effort to uh, have people work together to be able to produce software, there are two separate networks that are at play. So the first one is an organizational network, so sort of how the teams themselves are constructed, what reporting lines look like, things like that in sort of a traditional uh, you know, corporate-based software development process. Uh, the second part is the technical structure. So what's the actual inter, uh, interlinkages between uh, different technical components that are required for the software to actually uh, operate? And so 
when we're talking about mirroring, if, if we say that, uh, that the software and the, uh, and the organization are mirrored, um, you know, there's a very close mapping, nearly a one-to-one -one mapping between the technical system and the social system that is there to support the actual development of that. Uh, so why do we mirror? Why do, in particularly in the corporate space, do we try and mirror? So it turns out that this is a very effective uh, problem-solving technique. It's a very efficient one. Uh, and part of the reason behind that is that it ends up reducing the cognitive overhead required uh, to be able to understand how to problem solve and where to go to uh, within an organization to be able to solve a particular problem. If there's a team that is responsible for a particular chunk of the code, uh, then they're the team that you go to about it. You don't go to another team, right? Because in that particular situation, you would have a strong, uh, you would have strong mirroring within an organization. So it solves this problem of, you know, who owns this system? Oh, okay, right, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between a group of people and a group of systems. Uh, and the useful thing about this is that it ends up taking people to where the problems are within organizations. So if you've got a, uh, a, a poorly mirrored system, uh, often it, you sort of have that problem of like the bystander effect of like who is actually responsible in this organization for this particular system. Uh, you probably run into that in, uh, in your work life. Um, so if we have strong mirroring, it, it ends up being a clear ownership between technical systems and the people that, you know, that actually own those. Uh, and the reason that we do this as well, consciously, is that it ends up being a design choice to improve the congruity of routing information within an organization. And it ends up just being a really economical way to be able to develop things, particularly uh, in the corporate space. Okay, so let's do a quick recap of the highlights of the research uh, into organization design and orgs of complex systems and product design and products of complex systems uh, that have happened over the last 60 years. Uh, so. Back in 1974, uh, Jay Galbraith uh, put out this piece uh, in interfaces uh, called Organization Design and Information Processing View. And so this is a fairly sort of fundamental paper that a lot of the other research is built on afterwards. It's pretty, uh, pretty sort of wordy and a little bit dense, but I can give you the really short version of it, uh, which is that in uh, Galbraith's view, he says that there are three strategies that organizations use for coordination. Um, so the first is rules and, progr uh, rules and programs, so specified behaviors. If I see this particular thing happen, you need to go and do this other thing. Uh, hierarchy, so a hierarchy is there to route problems to the correct path and level within that particular part of the tree. Uh, and the third part is, the third strategy is targets and goals. So we're saying that people are choosing behaviors uh, to meet the targets. You're not mandating how you expect people to behave, but you sort of say, okay, we roughly want to go over there. You know, are we going to build a car? Are we going to ride a bike? You know, that sort of, that sort of way of thinking about it, not prescribing, you know, the mode of transport to get over there. Uh, and the other thing that Galbraith puts forward is that as uncertainty increases in an organization, the amount of information that has to be processed by the decision makers actually increases. And so, that means that we are actually introducing bottlenecks within our organization, or at least the way that we sort of strongly or not strongly mirror ends up introducing these bottlenecks as to like how do you route information to the right part of the organization to be able to solve a problem, right? And so the organization as a whole can do one of two things. It can choose to respond by reducing the need to process information, or it can respond by increasing the capacity to process information. Uh, and so there is like two different ways that it can do it with like creation of Slack resources or self-contained tasks with few dependencies on other parts of the organization. Uh, or we could be increasing the capacity, uh, or to increase the capacity, we could be investing in these vertical information systems. There's a lot of detail about this in the paper. Uh, but the one that I want to focus on just for a second is this creation of lateral relations. So who here is like vaguely familiar with the DevOps community? or has been sort of involved in one form or another. Okay, cool. So this is sort of a really fantastic and pithy uh, summary of like what we're actually trying to achieve in the DevOps space. Um, so we've got the rules and the programs and the hierarchical uh, referral and goal setting sit sitting on top of that. Uh, and so why this is actually important from a DevOps perspective is that it's about a creation of lateral relations within our organization. So we can have direct contact between individuals that are responsible for distinct parts of the system. We can have people that act in liaison roles. We can construct task forces or groups of people to be able to work on something together. Maybe we just construct a whole team, right? So like the whole idea of a DevOps team of having devs and the ops and working together. Um, maybe we have like an integrating role or some sort of managerial linking role to sort of traverse up the hierarchy and then back down again. 
Uh, the other interesting part here is like a matrix organization, and as far as I can tell, this is one of the earliest uh, references in management literature of this whole idea of a, a matrix organization. Um, who here, quick show of hands, has worked in that sort of organization before? With a bit of a, okay, so a couple of people. Um, so the, the whole idea behind uh, matrix organization is that uh, you have different capabilities within the organization, so product management, manufacturing, marketing, engineering, uh, and then you sort of construct a team and synthesize a team where you bring people from uh, those different disciplines all together to be able to solve a specific problem, right? So the whole idea of sort of cross-functional teams. Um, and the final thing that Galbraith puts forward in this paper is that the level of uncertainty that an organization is dealing with determines the adopted strategy. And organizations often have a preference for employing strategies that have worked for similar problems, uh, that at least from the outside, appear to be similar problems uh, that they've dealt with in the past. Okay, so that's the managerial side of things. And then if we dive into the product design and products as complex systems, this is where the, uh, where the research about how mirroring uh, hypothesis works or doesn't work gets really, really interesting. Uh, so uh, there's this paper that was put together around the same sort of time as Galbraith's one uh, by D.L. Parnas uh, called On the Criteria to be Used in Decomposing Systems as Modules, or into Modules. Uh, and uh, this gets referred to in a whole bunch of different uh, literature. Uh, I think I've I found references to it in at least sort of three, four hundred papers um, uh, ever since this was published. Um, and they're really like there's, it's it's a little bit verbose and not exactly clear in some places. But there's a a really interesting nugget in here which has been reused through all the different other research that's happened since this paper. Uh, so it's this concept of information hiding, where we have an interface or a definition to reveal as little as possible about the inner workings of a module of software, right? And this is a really fundamental core idea to the way that mirroring actually works. So we have a strong mirrored system. The people that are responsible for, uh, for part of that system, like a particular module or you know, uh, like a subsystem within that, um, they act as that interface right, in the same way that they don't expose a lot of context about what's happening within that. Because you know, it's impossible for everybody in an organization to understand in minute detail uh, what uh, you know? What everybody is doing, right? It's just—it's not. It's clearly not an efficient way to be able to run an organization. And so we can see this in a really interesting way in Henderson and Clark's paper from 1990 around architectural innovation, the reconfigure, reconfiguration of existing product technologies, and the failure of established firms. And this is a fascinating paper, um, like even if you're not thinking about it from an open source perspective. Um, so this is a three-year study of the semiconductor photo photolithographic alignment equipment industry. Who here, quick show of hands, actually knows what this is? Like, okay, wow, that's like way more people than I normally get when I talk about this. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is a, like a highly technical industry, um, and uh, you know, so there's actually a hardware that's produced as part of this, right? And so this is a field-based study within this high rate of change uh, industry, and they look at data from a variety of sources, both primary and secondary. Um, so you know, they, they went out and did primary research in a whole bunch of different organizations and, and talked to the people that were at those organizations during this period of technological change. Uh, and they looked at secondary data that was collected through things like you know, trade journals, uh, scientific journals, consulting reports, uh, that sort of thing. So this, uh, this study went on for quite a while and they compiled uh, up quite a large mass of data to be able to sort of come to a couple of their conclusions. So in this particular industry, there was four distinct waves of innovation between about 1962 and 1986. And so Within each of those uh, waves of innovation, uh, we saw changes in the type of equipment used. So we went from proximity aligner to scanning projection, scanning projection to first generation, and then second generation stepper. Right, so that's quite a lot of technological change within a single industry over a very short period of time. Now, what's even more fascinating about this is that with each wave of innovation, there was a new leader that actually emerged within the market. So first it was Kulik, then Casper, per uh, Perkin Elmer's GCA, and eventually Nikon, right? So, you know, that's a lot of churn in terms of industry leadership within a particular market, right? And, and part of the reason for the new leader emerging every time when there was this new wave of innovation was that each incumbent was unable to actually course correct to be able to take advantage of the new technological innovations that were available to them, even though each one of those companies invested really heavily in new technology. So like throwing literally millions of dollars at the wall to try and take advantage of that new technology. 
And the reason that each of these incumbent organisations were unable to pivot and you know, retain their market leadership uh, was because they structured the organisation of people and thus the communication based on their existing product architecture. And that's really where this innovation was happening within this industry. So every time there was a new wave of innovation, the product architecture was significantly different. But each of these organizations were unable to actually change and adapt because they tried to invest in this new technology based on the existing uh, organizational structure, which is absolutely fascinating. So what makes sense about this? Now, it turns out that there's even more depth to this paper. Um, so the way that they analysed this was through a framework based on an observations from two other industries. So they were looking at both aviation and the automotive industry. And then they, uh, they took their model and then they applied it to the photolithographic alignment, equipment alignment industry. Um, and so uh, then they were you know, validating that framework on that industry. Uh, so in the framework, they sort of come up with sort of two sort of key ideas. One around problem solving, the second around innovation. So they say that uh, within an organisation, when we are problem solving, we are employing these sort of three different methods. We've got channels, we've got filters, and we've got strategies. So a channel is sort of like a formal, like A reports to B. Uh, it could be an informal, so like I talk to Sarah because Sarah knows about the thing. Um, then we can also have you know, uh, A and B report to C, and therefore that actually represents an architectural relationship, um, not just within the organisation and the design of the organisation, but often within the product as well. And so we have filters that then boost the knowledge that's important or they discard knowledge that's unimportant. And obviously you can see how this sort of gets a little bit complicated when you've got these channels that are embodying this architectural relationship, you're trying to take advantage of this new technology and your filters that you've got in place are going to boost and discard the wrong knowledge often in a lot of cases. Um, so then the strategies are how we actually use those channels and filters to actually solve problems. So it's all a little bit abstract, but you know, we'll get to the actual details of it in a second. Um, so from an architecture perspective, we can think of our uh, technical architectures as being embedded in the channels, or having our architecture being embedded in the channels and filters and strategies of the organisation, right? It's the mirroring hypothesis and Conway's law and work. And so uh, they present this uh, other framework around uh, how innovation actually happens based on some work from Schumpeter in about 1942. So they basically posit that in this like two by two grid, uh, whenever you have this new wave of radical uh, innovation, so there's a new, uh, new type of technology that's being introduced to a market, you have, uh, you have new organisations that enter and they're sort of engaging in this radical innovation. Uh, as they mature and actually find a product market fit, they move more into this modular innovation over here. So that's where uh, the core concepts, architectural concepts are unchanged, but the, uh, sorry, the design of the thing is unchanged, but uh, industry-wide, a, uh, a lot of these core concepts are being overturned. And then we find that as an organisation grows, it actually bounces between this modular innovation and incremental innovation. And that's sort of what's required to, you know, keep the sort of, it's, it's sort of the fuel that keeps driving an organisation. And so, you know, once, uh, if a company is able to successfully employ these sort of strategies, and let's be clear, like a lot of it isn't actually conscious either, um, then once they get to the sort of point of uh, being the incumbent within, uh, within a particular industry, uh, and there is a new type of uh, technological innovation that's coming up, um, they have to then engage in architectural innovation. Right? And that's where, when you're, uh, you're fundamentally changing the way the architecture of your product works, this is where all of the organisations actually fell down. So we've seen it not just in the photolithographic alignment industry, but also in aviation and a bunch of other industries. Uh, so what makes sense about all of this? Well, the simple way to think about it is that in your organisation, um, don't mirror when you're exploring new opportunities. It's like a bad way to be able to, well, it's a pretty effective way, I guess, of sort of not taking advantage of what those new opportunities are. Um, and if you do mirror, uh, when, well, you do want to mirror when you're actually exploiting existing opportunities, right? So if you're engaging in lots of innovation, uh, don't mirror. If you are sort of exploiting the existing opportunities that you've got available to you, uh, then you do want to mirror. It's a very efficient way of sort of extracting a lot of value out of a previous investment. Uh, and so, you know, we can, we can see this pretty simply here. So you do want to mirror for these types of innovation and we don't want to mirror for these two types. And what we can then deduce from that is that organisations that mirror perform poorly in unstable environments. 
Okay, so that's the highlights of the research uh, from the last sort of 60 years, both on the managerial and the organizational side. Um, and so what we can sort of deduce more broadly from all of that research is a couple of things. So what we know is that organizations that mirror perform very well in stable environments with, lot of, with not a lot of innovation. Um, Partial mirroring is also a viable strategy. Uh, it can sometimes work within organizations. So what do I mean by partial mirroring? Uh, so the way to sort of think about it is like guilds within an organization. So when we're talking about guilds, the technical way of describing this is where you draw the knowledge boundaries more broadly than the operational boundaries. So what that actually looks like is that you might have a bunch of teams here that are responsible for you know, individual bits of technology. And so they've got clear operational boundaries around them. Uh, and often the uh, operational boundaries mirror these knowledge boundaries. So that's you know, this, this mirroring concept that we're talking about here. So when we're drawing the knowledge boundaries more broadly, we're saying actually it's really important to share a lot of the more detailed information uh, that you would normally keep confined within those operational boundaries because that ends up making, uh, making it easier for other people who have to interface with you in your organization uh, more, more aware of the stuff that you're going on with uh, and thus you, they are more likely to make decisions that are going to impact you less down the line. So this is sort of the strategy of partial mirroring here. Uh, we also know that it's possible to break the mirror within an organization. In fact, this is actually required if you're going to uh, engage in uh, architectural innovation or radical innovation. So we break the mirror by introducing partitions. So the way that that sort of works is that you know, we've got a one-to-one -one mapping between a team and a bunch of systems here. From the outside, it looks like it's, in, it's a single team, but perhaps we divide it up so that different people are responsible for different classes of work, but they're all working on the same sort of system. And then we eventually split the different systems outright. So from the outside, this team is providing a single service, but then internally, um, we've broken the mirror and we've actually said, okay, while there may be a shared bit of technology underneath it, um, we, are, we have individuals that are responsible for slightly different parts of that. Uh, we can also break the mirror by building relationships across technical boundaries. So I can go into the details of that later. It's probably not that important here. There are a bunch of drawbacks to this, though. And now we're getting into the open source side of things. So we know that it limits a lot of opportunities uh, for you know, engaging in this radical architectural innovation. You know, when we change things, we've got a new architecture. Uh, you know, we're switching things around. Uh, and because that architecture is embedded in the channels, filters, strategies, it's then introducing these bottlenecks. Uh, and so, you know, let's say that you've got a small part of the tree here that's responsible of people that are responsible for all these different technical systems, you know, that you're introducing bottlenecks within your organization. Uh, and as Galbraith said, as uncertainty increases, the amount of information that has to be processed by decision makers increases. And so, like I said, organizations that perform poorly, uh, uh, that, sorry, organizations that mirror perform poorly in unstable environments. Um, Okay, so let's get to the interesting bit around open source here. So it turns out that if uh, there's a whole bunch of research that has happened specifically in the last 20 years around how the mirroring hypothesis uh, does or does not work within the open source communities. And what we can actually say from that fairly conclusively is that open source projects that mirror don't actually perform as well. So that begs the obvious question, what is different about open source compared to typical sort of proprietary software development that happens within a single organization? So it turns out that there are three different dynamics at play with open source. The first is that uh, we have this formation of a core periphery uh, organizational structure. Uh, the second is that we've got uh, technical systems that are both very modular and have low cognitive complexity, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. Uh, and the last thing here is that we have transient groups of problem solvers assembling for limited periods of time that are often drawn from multiple organizations, like corporate or not, right? Okay, so let's start with the base building block here of the formation of the core periphery organization structure. So what does this actually mean? Well, when we're talking about a core periphery structure, the core are the contributors to an open source project uh, that are working on the larger components and sort of responsible for the overall cohesiveness of the technical system as a whole. Then we have per, uh, people that are on the periphery who are contributors to smaller localized components within the code base. So the modules that are sort of more sitting on the edge rather than the actual core of it. So they're there to sort of like scratch their own individual itch to be able to solve their problem with a broader piece of technology, right? 
And so Amrit and Van Held, uh, uh, Hilgersberg in 2010 uh, put this paper together around exploring the impact of socio-technical core periphery structures in open source software development. And so in this particular paper, um, they, it was basically a meta study of uh, all, these different, uh, all these different studies that you can see here of all these different open source projects. So some pretty big and high profile ones, so looking at you know, the Linux kernel itself, Apache, Mozilla, Linux again, uh, 120 random projects of SourceForge, um, GIMP, uh, uh, GNOME, uh, Python, you know, so pretty big stuff that we're all pretty familiar with and probably big users of in every, you know, on a, on a day to day basis. And so they put forward this onion model of an open source community. So uh, at the core, we have project leaders, uh, the core developers, uh, and then on the periphery, we've got these contributing developers and the bug reporters, the readers, and the overall passive users of a system. And the core periphery model, it's a nice catchy thing to say. It turns out that there's actually a little bit more nuance to it. So there's like a semi-core, semi, semi-periphery later, uh, sorry, layer of these contributing developers that are sort of coming in and out. Um, so uh, this is all based off a bunch of social networking uh, theory that was put together by Borgardi and Everett in 99, basically saying like in a core periphery system, the pattern of ties between the actors in a network in the core is more densely interconnected than the periphery. So that's what we're talking about here. So they identified that within any open source project, there's basically three distinct patterns of movement of contributors within that open source project. So the first is that there's uh, a steady shift away from the core. So this is a sign that an open source project is actually in trouble, right? So you've got people that have previously been uh, core developers and have been, you know, held a lot of responsibility within this open source project, and they are ba slowly backing off uh, over, a, over a period of time. And so if we see a large number of people doing this and, and not a lot of people going into the core to sort of replace them, um, that's a sign that the open source project is in, with, is, is in trouble. Um, we can also sometimes see oscillatory shifts between uh, away and towards the core. Um, so this is actually a sign of an open source project often that is growing, sort of engaging in this architectural innovation and sort of you know, growing up from like you know, uh, sort of an idea in somebody's basement into something that you know, millions of people are potentially using. Um, and we see this in like really, really big open source projects all the time. There's actually, there tends to be a, a pretty constant shift between people that are in the, uh, the core and the periphery of an organization. Uh, and then the last is that we sometimes see a no, uh, no perceptible shift away, to, or away or towards the core, right? So this is a pretty good sign of the overall stability of an open source project. Um, they reference this other work by uh, Naka, uh, Nakakoji in 2002, um, which I think is pretty salient for everybody in this room that's sort of responsible in any way for community uh, leadership or management. Uh, and they basically say that without new members aspiring to become core developers within an open source project, uh, that project, the development on that project, is going to stop the day that the existing core members decide to leave the project. So it's like, you've got to have a backup plan for getting new people into the organization, uh, you know, or the open source project. So the lesson that we can learn from this is that we want to make sure that within our open source projects, if we care about the long-term viability of it beyond our tenure of, of participation within an open source project, we want to ensure that there is a flow of peripheral contributions moving up the ranks to become core, uh, core contributors to a project. Okay, so the next layer down is where we've got technical systems that are both very modular and have a lot of, uh, have, but have at the same time have a low amount of cognitive complexity. So there's this other really fascinating paper by uh, Baldwin, McCormack, and Rosnack from 2014 around hidden structure, and it's using network methods to actually map the overall system architecture. Uh, and this is a really detailed paper that actually builds on uh, close to 15 years of research prior to it. Um, and some of, the, uh, some of the authors in this, uh, particularly Baldwin, uh, was one of the authors of the actual mirroring hypothesis paper that came out in 2016. Uh, so this study was fairly exhaustive. It looked at about uh, roughly 1,300 releases across 17 open source projects that were written in, a, in you know, various forms of C, so C, C++, or C Sharp, right? Uh, and over this period of time, uh, for each individual release, it uh, applied this software architecture analysis technique called design structure matrices. So I go into the detail of this, but it's a little bit boring. So the, the simple way to sort of read these graphs that you see here is that uh, each of these sort of nodes that you can see here vaguely, these are like photocopied papers. Um, 
every, every node that you can see here, uh, for any line that is going down here, it's basically showing an acyclical uh, dependency. So going from one module directly to another, any lines that are going up in the other, other direction are actually showing uh, cyclical dependencies, where you've got dependencies between two different modules to be able to, you know, to, be able to complete a particular task. Um, and from this, we can actually do, uh, and what they did was they did analysis using design structure matrices of these nearly 1,300 releases. And they were then, at each point, able to uh, classify the overall system architecture at that particular point in time. So if we saw that uh, a largest group of, uh, was, uh, of cyclical dependencies uh, was greater than 4% of the system, we would say that it's a hierarchical one. Uh, if the largest group of uh, cyclical groups is uh, a more than 1.5 times uh, the next largest, we say it's a multi-core. Larger cyclical group of 6% is, uh, sorry, is greater than 6% of, of the overall system, we say it's borderline core periphery. Um, yeah, so we can basically apply this categorization model to like any piece of software at a point in time. And so by looking at these, all these different open source projects over this period of time, they actually identified that 67% of these were uh, firmly in the core periphery camp. Now the 25% were borderline, 0.5% uh, were multi-core, and then about 7% of those were hierarchical. And in fact, if you look at the lineage of that 7% here that are actually hierarchical, it uh, turns out that they were previously proprietary developed, open so proprietary developed software that they ended up becoming open sourced. So over a period of time, we're actually seeing a broader trend within the, uh, within the industry and within the open source community uh, that for uh, uh, software that is originally written in a proprietary setting, for it to be viable in an open source world, it has to shift to becoming a core periphery or a borderline. Uh, and the other interesting finding from this particular paper is that open source projects have to have, or they do have smaller cores than the proprietary ones. And this can actually be changed um, through a whole bunch of conscious effort. And the reason that, they, that we see this a lot in open source projects is that the smaller cores actually mean slower, sorry, they mean lower, uh, smaller cognitive overhead when we're actually making changes, which is a primary way of actually getting new contributors in the door and getting them to stick around. Uh, so they put this whole, uh, they actually put together a formula for calculating the propagation cost of when you make a change within a system. Uh, it's really interesting, I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but I highly recommend that you uh, check out this paper. Uh, what we do know as well is that the overall modularity of an open source project can be changed consciously and it can be improved with effort. So if we look at Mozilla here, when it was first open source back in 98, uh, we see that you know, this, is, this is roly how it's rating on release by, re uh, release by release basis. And there was a new major version here, uh, the, uh, the largest group of, sorry, the largest cyclic group as of, uh, as a percentage of the system decreased here. And then you know, over a, a very short period of time, they went from being uh, sort of a very hierarchical system over to being a more core periphery system. Um, and you know, this definitely influenced the later development of things like Firefox and eventually Google Chrome. Um, we also see as well, particularly in the Linux kernel, that the modularity of the system as a whole actually fluctuates over time. So we can see here that you know, there's no consistent pattern. It's, you know, there's, no, there's, no, you know, th there's no concerted effort here to make the Linux kernel more modular. It's just that each particular sort of minor version release in this particular time frame was resulting in a different level of modularity, which is sort of fascinating. So we can see more recent real world examples of this as well. So if you look at uh, Terraform, a quick show of hands, who here is like vaguely familiar with Terraform. Okay, so for the people who aren't familiar with it, um, it's basically a tool for like managing infrastructure in the cloud and you can do a bit of on-prem infrastructure as well. Um, and so it's sort of like a declarative language to say I expect, the, I expect my infrastructure to look like this and it'll go and apply those changes. So uh, Terraform is what we would consider to be a sponsored, a commercially sponsored open source project. It's done by HashiCorp uh, and they made a very conscious split uh, about coming up on a year ago, um, to split the Terraform providers, so the bits that actually interact with different cloud service providers, out from the core of Terraform uh, into their own GitHub organization, and into, in fact into all of their own individual GitHub repositories. And so we can actually see the impact of this um, on the overall core periphery structure of Terraform. So this is when, you know, well, I'll let you guess what happened there, right? Um, they were absolutely making a conscious effort to split the, uh, the providers, the things that are you know, most relevant to the outside contributors and users of Terraform 
out into their own separate, self-contained, modularized chunk of code, right? And so, like I was saying, you know, we can, we can actually improve the overall modularity of the system through this conscious effort. And we see this for you know, commercially sponsored open source projects. It's absolutely fascinating to watch in action. So this leads us to the last point about how uh, Conway's law and the mirroring hypothesis uh, applies or doesn't apply within open source. So the last dynamic that's at play here that is very different to proprietary software development is that we have these transient groups of problem solvers who assemble for very limited periods of time to be able to solve a particular problem, right? And so uh, the, the way to sort of think about it is that uh, when we're doing that, we're actually uh, creating these very temporary, very ephemeral organization ties at a very low cost. This is like we're in a very different part of history in that when we look at uh, the way that uh, the mirroring hypothesis has been studied in the past in other industries, it's all about a physical output, you know, physical labor of love. Um, whereas in open source, none of it is real. Like, does any of it actually really exist? It's just bits on a disk, uh, and you know, you've got to understand how to read those bits off the disk. Um, so, you know, it's very, very low cost, super low cost. Uh, and the benefit of this is that we can actually mirror more aggressively in a shorter period of time and then disband those linkages very quickly. So the way that we can think about this is that there is temporal strong mirroring every single time somebody produces a pull request um, that, and you have a bunch of collaborators come together to be able to solve a particular problem and get that merged into the core, right? Or the periphery, whatever it is. Um, and, you know, Conway said it best, the flexibility of the organization is really important to this effective design and it should be organized around according to the need of communication. So the last paper that I'm going to touch on now is from West and O'Mahony in 2008 and it's around the, uh, the role of the participation architecture in growing sponsored open source communities. Uh, and so you're probably thinking, participation architecture, what on earth is that? Um, so this paper is really fascinating. It looks at uh, 12 sponsored open source communities and contrasts them with prior research on autonomous uh, open source communities. So you're probably thinking, like, what's the difference between the two? Uh, so autonomous open source communities are founded by individuals or small groups of people, uh, and they are grown through grassroots communication, right? A sponsored open source community tends to be founded by, an, uh, by a corporation or some sort of foundation and grown with a more strategic direction, right? Uh, and so a project's participation architecture is the sum of a bunch of different design decisions. We can actually see that those design decisions actually fit along three different dimensions. Uh, so those three different dimensions are the intellectual property rights, uh, the, and the way that uh, an open source project deals with intellectual property, uh, so, you know, it's about the allocation of rights to use the community's output. Now, whether that's sort of like an astroturf community or a legitimate community. And that definitely flows into the second point here around the overall model of community governance. So I'm sure we've all seen examples where, you know, there is uh, code that is open sourced by an organization uh, and it's there because they want to be able to get all the benefits of having a community around it, but they are very unwilling to be able to accept uh, contributions from people outside of that community, right? So they want people to be, you know, be able to use their software and be able to report bugs for it, but they're not really interested in sort of letting anybody outside of their organization exert any control over, their, over the open source project. Um, and so the, uh, the model of community governance is really a question about what are the trade-offs that an organization that is sponsoring an open source community, uh, how much of that control are they, they willing to relinquish to the community? Um, and, you know, there's a bunch of lessons here about, like, making all contributions from sponsors public by default and introducing friction uh, for private communication. And the last bit here is around development approach. So uh, they posit in this particular paper that a project's technical architecture is a subset of a communi uh, community's overall participation architecture. And so we know that the more modular a piece of open source software is, the shallower the learning curve is for newer contributors, right? And that, the reason that we're doing this is that it's helping people uh, who are new to the project focus on specific modules to solve specific problems. They don't have to worry about the system as a whole, right? So the lesson here is invest heavily in making code more modular, particularly, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're a sponsored uh, or an autonomous open source project, uh, modularity is the key here to being able to drive people into your project. Um, and, you know, not just the modularity, but the, the good documentation around that and what the actual contribution process is. That's really, really critical. And the final thing that they talk, here, talk about here is that the participation in a community is determined by two things. 
The first is the identified technical architecture and the org structure that results from the community's design decisions. Sounds a hell of a lot like those two ingredients of mirroring that we started out with. So the two networks, again, yeah, we've, got the, we've got those two, two networks. So we, you know, we, in commercial environments, the short version of this, you know what, you don't care about it. You're here for open source stuff. Let's totally skip through this. Uh, and you can totally have a look at the slides afterwards. There's a bibliography and everything. Uh, in open source communities, these are the salient points that you should care about. You want to invest in a core periphery organizational structure. You want to have public, well-documented contribution processes and introduce any sort of friction for an open source, uh, for a sponsor of an open source project around any sort of internal private communication and have that flow of peripheral contributors moving up the ranks into the core. Because again, the participation of a community is determined by these two things, the identified architecture and technical architecture for new people that are coming to the project and the org structure that, designs, uh, that, sorry, that results from the overall community's design decisions. Don't actively seek to mirror. We could get temporal strong mirroring already for free. That's the benefit of doing stuff in the open. Conway said it best. Flexibility organization is important to effective design, and the design effort should be organized according to the need for communication. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? All right, there's time? one question up the back. If you want to shout it out, I'm happy to repeat it as well. So the lesson you're giving us is it sounded to me like we have to use a core peripheral architecture for our software because our communities are organized in a core peripheral structure. Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways to interpret it. Um, and I can, I can dig up the slide later. Probably don't have a lot of time right now. Um, so uh, communities that organize their communication around core peripheral structures are more likely to succeed and to grow. Um, now, the question is, what's the level of mirroring between the core peripheral structure of communication uh, for the community and the actual technical output that, that is produced? And if you look, at the, you look at all of the research around this, there's actually the, uh, the open source projects that uh, mirror that core periphery structure from a technical perspective, uh, they are in the minority. The vast majority of open source, big open source projects that we see out there are not strongly mirrored. So it's not saying that the two approaches are necessarily incompatible with one another, but if we look at uh, just more holistically at the entire landscape of large open source projects, the majority are not mirroring at all. So like, by majority, I'm talking like 95% plus of all the really large open source projects. Probably time for one more question. Going, going. Cool. One last one just here. Okay. Hang on, this is Aryan. We're going to need a microphone. Howdy, um, Aryan indeed. So thanks for that. Um, it's interesting how you found a, a good range of research and papers that actually covered something from a different angle from which I knew it. Um, the Clayton Christensen books, the Innovators Dilemma series in well, for mid nineties, um, covers similar things from a completely different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, there. It, he goes into a cycle of modularity versus integration. And if you take that into our businesses, the businesses themselves actually become modules in the broader, in the broader range. And it actually becomes a cycle rather than a particular state. Yep. And the question um, is? Does that match with what you're, f because I, I didn't quite pick that up. It, it seems to be more an organizational state that you're in, and then you're working from that in, in what I've seen, it's more you have to change all the time, otherwise it doesn't work regardless. Sorry for phrasing it badly. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, it really depends on the nature of your organization and what it's meant to do. Like, is the, is the organization there to produce one particular type of product and that alone? Um, or is it there to actually like, be a long-term thing that grows and changes with the market around it, right? So uh, you, you want to be, if, if you want longevity in your corporate structure, you have to be able to reorganize how people are arrayed within that. That's the short version. All right, I think we're done we're for done. time. Thank you very much. We've got a day and a half. They can always catch up with you when they want. <laughs> nice little something for you from the good people who run this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.